Oh, hello. Sorry, I was just headed out to paint for a while. But of course, if you must speak with me, come in. Yes, yes, I can answer a few questions. Go ahead, then. I must hurry. I don't want to lose the light. My name? My name is Vincent van Gogh. Though many non-Dutch-speaking persons often refer to me as Van Gogh, I have to wonder how so many people think that it is perfectly acceptable to rip apart someone's name in order to make themselves feel more comfortable. For myself, I make it my goal to express myself eloquently at all times in the example of the great writers of the past. In this spirit, I have learned all that I can from these men, even learning five languages so I can better absorb their knowledge. But alas, I am far outreaching the beginning of the story. And what is a story without a beginning? Like a painting without the soul of the painter, a story without a beginning lacks the very essence of the teller. I was born in Groot Zundert in the Netherlands. This was at the beginning of spring in the year 1853. My parents named me Vincent after my dead brother. He died one year to the day that I was born, on March 30th, 1852. My parents were simple people who, being a preacher and a preacher's wife, always feel that they know how best I should live my life. I am the oldest son and the biggest disappointment to my parents, unlike my younger brother, Theo, who can do no wrong and holds the light of heaven inside him, according to our parents. It isn't Theo's fault, mostly, and I should hate to make it sound as though I have anything but the greatest adoration and respect for my brother. We have spent most of our adult lives apart, but he has always been the closest of friends to me and forefront in my heart. I'm sorry, I don't seem mean to seem so melancholy. It's just that this feeling of malaise has followed me and been part of my life even as a young boy. Perhaps it comes from going and visiting my own brother's grave and seeing my own name and birthday carved upon the tombstone. Or perhaps it's the fact that education was stripped from me at the age of 15 when I was forced to quit school and go to work for my uncle Cornelius at his art gallery. Whatever the reason, I found myself constantly searching for something I could not find, although I thought I had found it when I first transferred to London office of my uncle's company. It was in London that I found the very first love of my life. Her name was Eugenie Lawyer, and she was the daughter of my landlady. She was beautiful to me. I thought that I had found my she, the one and only. The only thing in the way was that she was already betrothed to someone else. I went to her father who, being a prat, wished to embarrass me within the circles of our society and refused to even let me see her. One night, I went to him. I stuck my hand into the flame of a candle there, and I said to him, let me see her for as long as I can hold my hand in this flame. And do you know what he did? He blew out the candle. I didn't let this stop me, however. I went to her myself and I professed my love with every bit of poetry I could manage, and yet she refused me. I do believe she did this simply to take full advantage of the sympathies of our society, showing herself to be virtuous and me to be the villain. It is no matter, though. I have been misunderstood and cast aside my whole life. I can admit now that perhaps I was a little over upset over this development, since she had my heart and I had nothing. I had a bit of a breakdown. Although I had grown quite fond of the English writers, Charles Dickens and George Eliot, I turned from these men and to the book that I knew could help me understand my life, the Bible. I do regret that I had left and wish that I had left my job on better terms with Uncle Cornelius. I was simply depressed when I began to tell customers that the art in the gallery was worthless and recommend that they not purchase it. It's no matter, though. I quickly found work as a teacher and also began to preach. I studied hard over the next year. I felt that I had a divine calling from the Lord to be a missionary, and although I had studied the Bible carefully in preparation 
for the entrance exam to the School of Theology in Amsterdam. They wanted me to take the exam in Latin. Latin is a dead language, and it was beneath me to be forced to converse on any level in that damned language, so I refused. Needless to say, I was denied entry and subsequently headed to Belgium to do the Lord's good work there. I began to work for the Church of Belgium in the winter of 1878. It was here in a region in the south of the country that I began to find my soul in the eyes of the common man. These people had nothing but themselves and their faith. Well, and of course me. They began to call me Christ of the Coal Mines, and I felt that I had found my place among the most spiritual and honest of God's greatest creation. I began to draw people. I wanted to show their plight and their determination. I saw such beauty in their filthy faces and their ragged clothes. I gave to them all that I had, not caring anything for the upper classes whom I detested as they could never reach the honesty of these simple souls. After that first year, the church decided that perhaps I was growing too close to its parishioners. I heard it rumored that they thought my time there had turned into some sort of self-righteous martyrdom, though I do not believe any such thing. With all that I did for those people, giving them my very heart and soul, I, however, did take something very important from this place on my way to Brussels. I had found a new religion, a new calling, the highest calling of all. I would be an artist. I would show the world all of the things they refused to see and show them in a way that no one had before. With this new calling in mind, I began to take art lessons in Brussels in the fall of 1880. My brother, whom I wrote to of my heart's desires often, began helping me financially. He was an art dealer, and he wanted me to find a true calling and to settle down. I read everything I could about art in this time, studying Millet and Charles Brugot. I wanted to be the very best in the craft that I could be good enough to support myself through drafting. My cousin Kate, who had recently lost her husband, became such a comfort to me in this time, and I to her. I wanted so badly to find a wife, to settle in my role as husband and father, but relationships had never come easily to me. I told Kate that I felt that she knew me best of anyone, and I knew her better than anyone, and said that we should be married. She, quite humiliatingly, responded, No, never, no, and then she fled, leaving me behind. I was so haunted by these words. How is it that love was never mine to hold on to, only to be a constant torture to me? In the face of all that unhappiness, I decided to leave Brussels, and I moved to the Hague, the city in the western coast of the Netherlands. Yes, it was fine for me to go home and practice my craft there. After all, is this not where Rembrandt, the greatest artistic soul of all, was born? It was there that I came the closest to a relationship, and with a prostitute named Kalencia Maria Hornick. We became lovers, and she was beautiful, even if others couldn't see her beauty. She became my model as well, and we moved in together. I thought that I had finally found what I was missing in my life, and when she went back to prostitution, I was devastated. There I was, working day and night on my art, trying to be the support she needed, and I could not be. My family hated the idea of our relationship and threatened to cut me off if I persisted with her. So, in mid-September, I left to visit the countryside of the Netherlands. <coughs> For weeks, I moved from town to town in the Dorinth area, painting furiously everything that I saw, the countryside, the towns, the people. I had never worked so hard in my life, and yet people often looked at me as though I were insane or lazy or both. How, I would think to myself, can they say that when I am painting as quickly as I can, all that I can? 
Once while on this trip, I saw a group of common peasants eating at dinner. I began on working on what I called my first masterpiece, the potato eaters. This painting was pulled from my soul, and I felt that it so beautifully captured the life of the working class. I wrote to my brother and I told him that I badly wanted to come to Paris to further my skill and sell my paintings. He didn't think that people would like my paintings there, but I knew I could show him how good I was if I only had the chance. So I decided to surprise him by going to Paris to live with him. His apartment was quite small, but I didn't mind. In Paris, I found all of the love of art I imagined I would. Here I found souls like my own that I could call friends. We would often use each other for models to save money and spend long hours discussing the many philosophies of art. If only they had not so often turned against me. Eventually we grew apart as I grew tired of their constant complaints that my nature was one of controversy when I only wished them to understand me. And it was in Paris that I found my deep love of Japanese art. I loved the way they used color and light and painted such vivid scenes of nature. This is precisely how I found myself in the south of France in the winter of 1888. After a good friend and fellow artist told me that the light in Arles was a mirror to that of Japan. I found a little yellow house in Arles and began and I immediately fell in love with its charms. Without much financial support and my unending need for supplies, well, let's just say that small things are enough to support the body when the soul is so completely full. I had bread to eat, coffee to drink, and of course, absinthe to expand my consciousness. There is so much of this time that I cannot recall. It appears that I pick up filthy things and eat them, although my memories of these moments are vague. The doctors say that it seems that I want to poison myself on my own paints. Ridiculous. I would never... Oh, wait. No, of course. I'm skipping ahead again, aren't I? Let me go back. You see, when I left Paris, my dear brother Theo was worried for me. He sent a man named Paul Gangen to the Arles to watch over me, but very quickly Paul and I realized that we could not stand each other. In just a month we were constantly bickering. One night Paul and I were arguing and he stormed out. After this I went to see a young lady, well, a working young lady that I knew, and I brought her part of my right ear as a gift, I suppose. In truth it's also hazy. I know not exactly my own mind on the subject. Anyway, the next morning the police arrived in my room and they took me to the Hotel Dieu hospital to be seen about. Although I was sad to go, I realized that my mind also needed a rest. It had become so difficult to stay in the present reality. So I checked myself into St. Paul de Mosul, an asylum in the St. Remy province. The rest did me good, and I produced some good paintings there. Some were even talked about and sent on to Brussels to be viewed, including one called Iris, which I quite liked, and one that I was not well pleased with but seemed to be popular. I called that one Starry Night. I guess that was about, oh, nearly nine months ago now. Nothing much came of the showing, though Ma Theo managed to sell a piece called The Red Venue for 400 francs. Theo and his wife have a baby now. More and more, I feel that I'm a burden to my dear brother who loves me so well. I do not blame him. I am what seems a stranger even to myself most days. But I have tried to find myself and to show the world a little of itself in the process. I have been so happy in my art, always so joyfully unhappy, I guess one could say. But then again, who is not? 
if not quite so much as me. <coughs> well now, if you'll excuse me, I have to head out to the fields this fine July morning. Thank you so much for coming by. And if you see Theo, tell him, well, tell him I love him deeply, and I always have. Vincent Van Gogh shot himself in a field behind his house on the morning of July 27, 1890. The bullet did not kill him right away, however. He was found in his room and was taken to the hospital. The doctor sent for his brother, Theo, who made it in time to speak to his brother. On July 29th, Vincent Van Gogh died in his brother's arms. He was 37. While he was obviously a troubled man, and quite often a narcissistic and selfish one, Vincent taught us all to love color and to take in the world around us, to savor this crazy, unpredictable, wonderfully scary world for as long as we can. And now I understand what you tried to say to me, how you suffered for your sanity, how you tried to set them free. Perhaps they'll listen now. And when no hope was left in sight on that starry, starry night, you took your life as lovers often do. But I could have told you, Vincent, this world was never meant for one as beautiful as you. From Vincent by Don McLean. Thank you so much for listening, and please feel free to contact me or research further with the sources listed about this unusual man and his incredible art. Thank you.